Amen. Greetings to all my father's children. Welcome to another Bible study this Wednesday evening. God richly bless you for joining. I pray and hope that all our hearts will be blessed as we delve into the word this evening. This evening we will be shifting a little bit to focus on something that the Lord has impressed upon my heart. Um, <clears throat> it is coming straight. Amen. A, a combination of Old and New Testament scriptures. The particular subject matter has a theme, and it is simply this, the, the enemy within. And of course, there is a, a little sub below it that says the fifth column. As we go through I will, I will expand and you will see clearly where it is that we are going when we talk about the enemy within the fifth column. Uh, we will explain what that term means and we will apply it to ourselves so that we can see how serious uh, a struggle, a fight we are in as we walk with Almighty God. It is important, and we would have heard it from time to time, it is so important that we understand who our enemies are as we pursue God, as we walk along this Christian path. It is important because we are engaged in warfare, and we have been taught this over and over. And as we engage and we continue to fight and will fight until the day that Jesus comes, as we have always said, we must know who the enemy is. Now, we have spent a lot of time teaching, and we have heard ministers, both from within our local assembly and outside, indicate that, of course, we are in warfare and the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And that is true. That is Bible. And we have expounded on that. Uh, we have learned that we must be careful of the wiles of the enemy, the strategy of Satan. And it is a an absolute must, a necessity that we take the time out and understand his strategies, understand his wiles. That's what is meant when we say strategy or wiles. They're the same thing. We must understand how he operates, his modus operandi, how he utilizes his minions, the demons around to, you know, carry out his instructions to sabotage and to hold us at bay and keep us at a distance from, you know, where we are supposed to be. But a lot of times in our bringing this warfare to the people of God, we tend to focus the attention on the enemy as it relates to Satan and the things that he does and he continues to do. We focus the attention on the, 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 the minions that work along with him. We focus on our attention on the world and the effect and impact that the world has, that it has on us as uh, people of God. And so we have the notion, and rightly so, that the enemy is throwing things at us from all angles. The world, it is throwing things at us to get to our mind and get into our consciousness so that we can be distracted and we will then be diverted from following the precepts and the, the principles outlined in the Word of God that will take us to that place that we are all striving to get to. And so our view of the warfare, like in any warfare in the natural realm, you identify the enemies, whether they are east or west or north or south, identify where their missile launchers are activated and are hidden and try to do what we must do strategically and otherwise to mitigate against their missiles, the enemy's missiles, the enemy's attempts to get to us. We have to safeguard against him getting to us. And so sometimes we leave 
with the impression that the enemy is only outside. It is the world. The Bible says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Be careful of your adversary, the devil. And we, the scriptures are clear and they are replete across the New Testament and the Old Testament showing how he operates. But if we are not careful and vigilant, based on how we expound it and how it might have been reinforced with those who join with us in preaching and teaching the gospel, we might be left with the distinct impression that our focus must always be uh, on the eastern flank or on the western flank, on the northern flank, or on the southern flank. But I want us to understand in Bible study this evening with this topic that we are looking at, the enemy within, the fifth column. I want us to understand something, and I want us to, it was really impressed on my heart, and I just broke from what I was going through over the last couple of weeks, and to zoom in on this particular area. I want us to be very clear in our minds as children of God, as people of God, that as we continue to war, there is an enemy that we often overlook and significant damage is being done to us as individuals. And if it happens to us as individuals, it is going to spread across to other individuals and therefore it will have an impact on the body. I must make this point and state this clearly at the very outset that there is nothing that any one of us can do to damage or destroy the church of the living God. This church is set, was a set up, it is a, was established upon the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. It was Jesus himself who said upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. Now we know that the gates of hell is going to strive and is going to fight against it and is going to do everything. But the point is nothing can stop the work of Almighty God. Nothing can destroy the church of God. Nothing can divert the will of God that is to be spread across this earth. It doesn't matter what the enemy does. It doesn't matter how Satan tries. He cannot frustrate the will of Almighty God. God will allow things to happen. And because he allows it to happen, it will happen. But God's purpose cannot be subverted. God's purpose cannot be diverted. God's purpose cannot be stopped. I want us to know that if it was able to be stopped and to be subverted or sabotaged or diverted, it means that God would not be fully in charge and in control. And I am submitting to us tonight that God is fully in control. God is fully in charge. In fact, the Bible says that God is sovereign. So he is above all. He is overall. His will must be done. Every other will will have to be diverted and take the side road or take the back road. But God's will must be done. He is sovereign and he is in charge. And it is important that we understand that. With that understanding, I still want now to bring to our attention what we are up against when we are fighting in this battle. Now, having said that, there is something that is of extreme importance. There is a little concept I want us to catch, I want us to, 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 to appreciate. As I made mention of the theme that we are at the topic for the subject matter tonight, the enemy within, the fifth column, I want to explain that term, the fifth column. Now, we all know the importance, the value of having columns in our structure. In architectural terms, in building terms, when we talk about columns, we are talking about 
structural support. We are talking about things that give strength to hold up a building, to, to support a building. Other terms used in scripture are pillars, you know, pillars, uh, say similar thing, columns, pillars. They are essentially um, structures that hold up buildings, give support to towers, to large buildings that are going up to house many or few. So if one is building a house, a big house, for example, you're, gonna, you're thinking about four main structures. And just as though you talk about four main walls, you might have additional walls inside, but a structure, a nice building will consist of four main powerful walls, and then the walls that are being built are supported by four strong support system known as pillars or columns. And so we understand the term as it relates to building and architecture. I want us to apply this symbolism to our spiritual life, to our spiritual walk, and we will see something coming out um, in a short while. But as we look at buildings and we look at the four main columns, the four main pillars, uh, we see strength and support, yes, for whatever is being built. Now, there is a term that is used right across the globe called the fifth column. Uh, the word fifth means one more than the, the fourth. So the one, two, three, four that we just mentioned gives support and, and, and gives the impression or the connotation of strength to a building that is going up. And the four columns mean the four, north, south, east, west. Everywhere there is a support structure. But then when we talk about the fifth, there is no place, for example, for the fifth because all the four corners are already fully supported. So you might see a fifth column going between one of the four that is already there. And it is not doing any work in terms of supporting the building because the building is already supported by the four main columns. And, you know, this is a kind of symbolism. The four main columns support the structure. So there is no need for a fifth column. If you see a fifth column there, it might be for beautification, but it is not lending any strength. It is not giving any support to the building because it already has the, the colors the columns, the, the, the pillars that are needed for strength and support. So the fifth column might be there, but it is not doing any strengthening and supporting work. What then is the value of the fifth column? And so the term fifth column is a term that is negative in its connotation. In fact, a definition of the fifth column, and you will you can do a little research on the fifth column, check it out, Google it, check it out, and you will see and appreciate the term fifth column, but it has a negative connotation. And it simply refers to a member of a group of people who support the enemies of a particular country that they live in, and in a secret, quiet way, help the enemy to bring down the particular country. So in America, for example, you will, there was a time when you had the civil war and although it was one country, uh, the southerners were fighting against the northerners and you would have folks who they would refer to as the fifth column. They were like spies or saboteurs and they, they might have been on the northern side but they didn't like what the northern side were doing, so they quietly supported the southern side and would pass on information, strategic information, and do whatever it was to kind of undermine their particular territory, although they were a part of the territory. And that's, that's the kind of meaning of the term fifth column. So when you hear fifth column, it is really talking about an, an individual who seeks to undermine, who seeks to sabotage, who seeks act almost like a, a, a spy 
to help the adversary, to help those that are opposed to what is actually happening in your own territory. Now, having said that, I want to illustrate it with something that we are familiar with. So I'm talking broadly now, and I'm going to bring it in home, close, 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 close to our hearts, so that we see exactly what is happening in the realm of the spirit, so that we see exactly what is happening and how we can be sabotaging our own selves because we are unaware of how battles really are fought. Yes, it is a fact, and I said it earlier, you will have the enemies from without, you will have missiles being sent to you from without, you will have the world to contend with, which is from without, you will have Satan to contend with, who is from without, you will have the, the, the demons from all left, right, and center to contend with, again from without. But never underestimate the fifth column. And we are going to show us who the fifth column is and how the fifth column works to undermine our move towards greatness and undermine our move towards serving God in the way that God expects us to serve him. And many times we point our finger at the devil and it's not really Satan. Ultimately, it's going to go back to him. But some things that we many times say, Satan did this and Satan did that. And it's because of the world system and I allowed this to happen and all kind of things conspiring against me and so forth. Many times, beloved, that is not the case. And because we are unaware, many times we are the defeated when we should not be defeated. So we are going to take the time and we are going to look and examine the enemy within and see who that fifth column individual is, a person is, our system is, so that we can be aware and take remedial action and allow for our work to step up so that we can be counted as true, real children of God. Very important. All of us would have known about the situation in 2001. We call it 9-11. The world calls it 9-11. And it was a tragic event in the United States of America. Of course, in the USA, many of our families are there. Many of our friends are there. The USA is a friend of Jamaica. That country, the USA, is a friend of many in the region across the world. And something tragic happened in the USA uh, over two decades ago, uh, on the 9th of September, or the 11th of September, sorry, 2001. A tragic event. We know that the planes flew into the Twin Towers. We know that the towers came down. We know that there was death and mayhem and chaos in New York City at that particular time. And we wonder, how is it that the great America, they have so much weapons of defense. They have so much weapons of offense to put them in fighting mode. They have intelligence. Uh, yes, they have the secret service. They have the spy network. How is it that a great superpower like the USA who have their tentacles right across uh, were able to allow the enemies to fly through to come into their territory and to get passports and to hijack their own local commercial airlines and then to take the commercial airlines and fly them into buildings not only did they go into the twin tower there was a plane that was heading to the white house there was a plane that actually went to the pentagon and fell into a part of the pentagon i want us to understand that this clearly from all indication was attack, was an attack from the enemies of the United States of America. There's a show called Enemy of the State. Enemies of the state actually swooped in on America and look what happened in 2001. How could a powerhouse, how could somebody that had it, a country, sorry, that had it all there, the best weaponry of defense, the Patriot missiles, all these things, all the spy network and satellites that are 
across space. How could it be that their protective system was breached and the enemies from outside got the upper hand that they could strike America in its heart and somehow bring it to its knees? How could that happen? I want us to understand because for whatever reason, I looked at that thing and I said, how could it happen? But then it can happen. How is the mighty fallen? It can happen. But as we traversed time, I started to see documentaries coming on the television. And as we listened to them, we started to find out. We learned, I, I, I learned, I could be right, I could be wrong, but it is what was in the documentary, that it was more than what meets the eyes. They said that while enemies were on the outside, everybody trying to get in, America was always able to defend itself. They were always able to pick up chatter on the internet. They were always able to pick up telephone conversation and conversations and know when things were being planned to hurt them. And so they would preemptively get involved to protect the homeland. They were good at doing that. They were always doing that. And so they knew who their enemies were, whether it was in the Middle East, sections of Africa, across the Eastern European countries, where Russia, they, they, they knew who their enemies were. And so they were always surveying and monitoring and defending themselves against the enemies that they knew. However, by now, many of us would have heard some of the documentaries, and people are of the view that what happened at 9-11 was an inside job. Folks were saying that before the first plane hit and there was an explosion, there, there was an explosion on the ground floor, like a few minutes before the first plane hit into the World Trade Center. And when the investigation started, folks were saying, but no, man, there seemed to have been some dynamite or some bomb that was detonated at the bottom of the building. And that's how the building collapsed. They were you now getting into engineering designs and saying, if a plane hit a building so far up, it wouldn't collapse from the bottom. You, could, you would have a lot of damage at the top and different things would happen, but you wouldn't have an implosion. But what we saw happening with the World Trade Center is that it imploded and just fell down on itself. They say a plane, the engineers and the technical people say a plane hitting at the top would not cause an implosion like that. It had to be something that was wild and set at the base of such a high tower that would have exploded to cause it to fall the way that it fell. That is, those are scientific and engineering principles being presented. And so they came to the conclusion, those that concluded, that there was an inside job. They came to the conclusion that 9-11 was more, and conclusion might not, don't necessarily mean the government of America. I'm just talking about people who documented the thing and looked deep into it and gave some scientific evidence and some engineering evidence and they put their things together. Those folks came to the conclusion that it was more than what met the eyes. So many have now left with the feeling that some things happened on the inside. And as a result, the conclusion by those folks that it was an inside job. It was not necessarily, yes, folks would have come from outside, but they would have allowed them to come because it was going to support what they ultimately wanted. So they allowed them to come. They could have defended against those folks, but they had some agenda according to these folks. But at the end of the day, to how the building collapsed, to what all transpired, those technical folks were saying it is an inside job. Why am I saying that? When it comes to an inside job, when it comes to something from within, when it comes to a fifth column, as we have just defined what a fifth column is, somebody inside working for somebody outside to sabotage and to cripple the existing homeland or the existing place that is a place that is yours. 
when there is a fifth column, when there is inside workings taking place, it doesn't matter that you have all the things to be a defense against the enemies on the outside. The building will still fall if you are unable to dig deep enough to identify the enemy within. It is the enemy within that would have allowed the atomic bomb to move from one country to another to another. Whether it is for money, whether it is for whatever other kind of gains that they may have, we from history realize that there are enemies within who take from within and pass it on and cause a demise of a place that otherwise would have been strong. And it is against that background that I want to bring all of that and apply it to our spiritual life, to our spirituality. I want us to understand, beloved, that it is the same kind of forces that are at work right now. We might be doing good as it relates really to putting on the whole armor of God and having our feet, you know, going in a particular way and our head covered in a particular way and our breastplate on in a particular way and have the sword in our hand in a particular way and we have on the whole armor of God and all defensive and even offensive. But, 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 there is something that I want and it, it, it somehow hit home to me hard um, a, a few days ago, a day or two ago, and I just thought to bring it together and present it to us. Be very careful of the fifth column. Be very mindful of the enemy within, because lest we think we stand, we fall. Lest we think we are standing, we end up falling, falling like the twin towers in New York because we were unable to identify and recognize that there was an enemy within. And while that enemy within is quietly, secretly working, and we are actively protecting from the enemies without, there is still a falling off, a crumbling, because we did not take stock and identify and deal with the enemy within. So we are going to take our time and we are going to go into, and we are going to do this quickly. So you have to just follow keenly. Um, you know, we're not going to read all the scriptures, but I'm going to put them there for us. And I want us to understand that this principle, the fifth column, this principle of that enemy inside, this principle where if you can't get them from outside, get them from inside. It is a principle that not only is used in warfare in the natural material realm, but it is a principle that is used in spiritual warfare. And we, saw, we, we will look and see how it manifested itself way back there, almost from the very beginning in the book of Numbers. And we are going to turn to our slides at this time, and we are going to look at the book of Numbers. In fact, we are not going to turn to it, but we are going to go into the books of Numbers 22, 23, and 24. So I just let you know that right now. So we're on the screen, and I want you to, we won't get to read because you're talking about three chapters. So we won't get into reading the chapters per se, but I want you to make a note and take your time and read, go through and read these very important chapters because they give us a thorough and fulsome background to what it is that we are going to be focusing our attention on. Now, the children of God had just defeated the Amorites. 
So we want that slide. The children of God had just defeated the, the Amorites and it caused a lot of problems. They realized the neighbors, neighboring countries around realized, yes, that look, man, it seemed as if Israel was unbeatable. They were going and conquering tribe after tribe and, you know, group after group on their way to a particular place. And we know that God had directed them to go to a particular land in Canaan. And on their way, they were, folks were standing in their way and every enemy of Israel was defeated. Here they had just defeated the Amorites and were on their way. And as they were passing by Moab, the king of Moab, Balak himself, was in great fear and distress. He recognized what was happening to the other tribes and the other countries where Israel passed. All the others who stood in their way, they were totally defeated. And he was aware. And he wasn't sure what Israel was up to. So what Balak did was sent and call a prophet, a Gentile prophet, by the name of Balaam. And Balaam was known in the region and recognized. Now, he was a Gentile. We don't know the history uh, of Balaam. We, we don't have a lot, although the Bible did, at, even in the New Testament, speak of Balaam, and for, for, certainly for bad. But we don't know a lot. We don't know why and how God used this Gentile. He was not a part of the people of Israel. Israel, but then this is the sovereign God that we serve. And here it is that a Gentile man, God used and used him as a prophet to do his beck and his call to do his will. And we see where Balak had now sent and hired Balaam to come over and to literally curse the people of Israel, the children of God. Um, but they, we, we understand that whoever God bless, no man can curse. And once God blessed the people of Israel and they were living with him and living for him and keeping within his precepts and walking in his way, they had the favor of God upon them. I want us to understand, beloved, that once we are walking with God as best as we can and we are doing our best to keep within the confines of his word, I want us to understand that you are blessed. And it doesn't matter what any individual here or anywhere that they are located try to do to stop you, to, to hinder you, to hurt you, to overturn you. I want you to know that the adversary, the enemy, Satan, does not have that power because God actually place a hedge around you. I want you to, as a group and as an individual, God has a hedge around you once you're walking with him. And I want to make that clear to every child of God today. I want us to understand that, all right? And it is important for us to hold on to that. And I'll talk a little bit more about that hedge around us and use scriptures to prove it to us. Now, remember, remember, Balak has now called Balaam and wanted him to curse them because if they are cursed, then they will have no power. If they are cursed, they will have no status with God. If they are cursed, the favor that was with them as they demolished the other nations would not be there. And so Bal Balak knew exactly what he was doing. He knew the principles of spirituality simply because they had false God and they knew that they had to please their God. And if the God was displeased to them, they knew that evil things would happen. And a cursed people cannot find favor with any God for that matter. And Balak knew that. So he wanted Balaam to curse the children of Israel. But then Balak actually tried to do it and found out that it was not God's will for him or anybody else to curse his people. They were his people, the sheep of his pastor. And there was no way that God was going to curse those people whom he had blessed. And so long as they continue to walk with him, they would have the favor of God. They would have the protection of God. They would have the hedge of God around them. And it is important that we, that we understand that. And so he tried a couple of times after the first 
meeting between the emissaries of Balak that went to Balaam after the first meeting and he outrightly rejected them, a more nobler set came. And he rejected them, a more nobler set came. We find out that the adversary does everything to try to tear down and to stop and to stop you, yes, on your walk with God. He tries to hinder and to turn upside down the work of God, the move of God, the individuals that are serving God. And you're going to see that happening to you in your daily walk. And this is very important, beloved, that we understand what is at play and what is happening here. And so even a prophet he used, a prophet having learned from God that this is not God's intention to curse these people, the prophet still tried. And it just wouldn't work. At one point when he opened his mouth in defiance of God's instructions that you cannot curse these people because I have blessed them. And if God bless you, beloved, you are blessed. If you curse, you curse. But I'm telling you, if God bless you, you are blessed. Nothing formed against you will prosper. Nothing that rises up to condemn you. Yes, every mouth that will try to condemn you, those mouths will be stopped. If you are blessed of God and you are walking with God, you have the great defender on your side. And it is important to understand that. No, look at what happened. Everything that was pushed at Israel from outside, it didn't work. Even the prophet that tried from outside to open his mouth and blow a curse and the children of Israel. It was happening from outside. It didn't work. The edge was around his people. The hedge of protection was around the people, and it didn't work. In fact, when he opened his mouth, when Balaam opened his mouth to curse them, the Bible said words of blessings issued from his mouth, and the people of God we're blessed. God will take a curse situation, something that people are trying to use to demoralize you and to distract you and to turn you and to turn the church upside down and to put the church under fire. God will take any situation and turn it around and make it into a blessing once it comes to his people, once it comes to his business, this is how, so long as we are walking with God and we are following his precepts and his word, I am telling us, beloved, God has a way to turn things around and what was meant for evil, God will turn it into good. This is how he operates when his favor is on you, when his favor is on us as a body, the church of the living God, that is how God operates. But notice what happens. While we will not turn to it now, I want us to, make, to mark Numbers 25, verses 1 to 3. I want us to mark, you're going to have to read it, Numbers chapter 31, verse 16. <laughs> I want us to notice, beloved, that after all that Balaam did, and it didn't work, Everything that he did from without, he met with the princes, he met with more nobler princes, they planned and they schemed and they, they exchanged gifts because he was a greedy man and for filthy lucre, he was willing to do what God told him not to do. And all of these things were happening on the outside, but the people of God continued to walk with God and continued to be obedient to their king. And to that extent, the hedge of protection was around them. But there was something that Balaam did that changed the entire dynamics. And we see it in those two scriptures. And as we look at the next slide, we are going to see that what happened that caused mayhem, both in the nation, the amongst the children of Israel and to the individuals that made up the people of Israel. Something happened, and it is right there. Balaam decided, and he, he spoke it. He said, you will never be able to get these people from without. In essence, this is what he was saying. You will never be able to cause their God to curse them. 
You will never be able to do anything from outside to get these people to turn away from their God and to cause them to lose the favor of God and to cause God to judge them. And you, that's not going to happen. And he saw it based on what he was doing and nothing was working. You know what Balaam did, beloved? Balaam went inside the camp, within the camp, and caused the people of God, literally caused the people of God, because he knew that a curse from without was not going to work. He knew that an outside job was not going to work. He knew that it had to happen from within. So we are, should be on the next slide. He knew that it should have happened from within. So what did he do? What did the Bible say that Balaam did? The Bible said that Balaam went and caused the children of Israel. He caused the men to go in unto the Moabites ladies. And he caused the children of Israel to start to serve the gods of the Moabites. In other words, he did nothing from the outside because the pushing from the outside wasn't working. They were able, they were walking with God and any enemy that rise up against them, God, with his divine favor, <clears throat> favor upon them, protected them and caused them to manage and manipulate and manhandle their enemies. So Balaam recognized, and it is important that we understand that Balaam recognized that they couldn't be cursed from without. What did he do? He went within the camp and caused them, the Bible said, to fornicate. And we're not even talking about the Israelite men with the Israelite ladies. It was even worse than that. It was the Israelite men with the Moabites ladies and the Moabites men with the Israelite ladies. The very thing that God had outrightly told them not to do because it is going to mash up the relationship that you and I have. They went and they did that. They were coerced from within. And not only that, they now started to commit whoredom in terms of idolatry. Because once you start to have that interface, once you start to have that breakdown from within, then everything goes. And so they started to mix with the God of the Amorites. And so there was a mixing and a diluting of the things that God told them not to get involved in, not to be a part of. And guess what? It was only then that God decided that he was going to deal with Israel and he was going to pass judgment on Israel. They were now cursed. The hedge was now broken, beloved. And it didn't happen from a curse by Balaam. It happened from inside of the camp because within they started to go the men from Israel with the women from Moab inside. Balaam got to what we call the fifth column. Quietly, secretly, he enticed, yes, and encouraged. And he knew that there was a weakness in men. And if we get to the carnal part of a man and start to entice and to encourage and to push and to get at that weak nature, carnal nature, that enemy inside, both inside of the man and ultimately inside of the camp. Forget about the cursing. Forget about doing anything from outside, Balaam advised. We will cause them to 
sin against their God. We will cause them to turn away from their God simply by getting to them on the inside. And he did just that. Got to the inside and everything started to happen. Look how many battles they fought and won. Look how many countries they passed on their way that Bela, Bela, the king of the Moabites, was terrified when he looked and saw them just encamped on the bottom of his territory. They, they really didn't even seem to have any plan to trouble Balak. But out of fear, because of seeing them, he was agitated and he wanted to curse them so that they could have been destroyed. And they could not do it. No matter how they tried. Why? A hedge was around them. They had the favor of God. They had protection. And only they could move the favor of God. The peoples on the outside, the things that they tried with the enemy, the darts and the wiles that they threw and the arrows that they shot at the children of Israel, none of them reached because they were walking with God and walking in the precept and the hedge of God was around them and they could not be cursed. However, as soon as Balaam agitated, and got into their space and got inside of the camp to the extent that he allowed and pushed and worked on their carnal nature. Then the men were sleeping with the women from Moab. The men from Moab, Moab were sleeping with the women from Israel. And it caused a great mayhem from within. And brethren, it was now the end of their protection. The protective shield is now gone because they have messed up. And I'm telling you, sin always put a wedge between us and God. And the covering that we have when we are in alignment with God and his word is going to be gone when we have messed up. We will be exposed. We will, we will feel naked. And in fact, we'll be naked because the hedge is removed and we are now vulnerable to the attacks of the enemy. I want us to understand that. And so with that, I want to look at a scripture in the book of Job to establish that principle that we are covered. Because when we see that, when we understand this principle, then it takes me to the next part that I want us to look at so we can understand clearly why we must walk and why we must walk right and why we must do what must be done so that we can keep the edge. Because without the edge, we are going to be vulnerable to the extent that we will fall. This is even more serious than the outside attacks. We, we know what to do. We know how he's going to come. We know the strategies of the adversary. Paul tells us to be mindful of the wiles of the enemy. So we know his strategies and we have gone through those from time to time. So we are aware and we, we have put up our guard and we have the defensive mechanism and even the offensive mechanism. We have them. However, the part that we have not focused a lot of attention on, the part that we have allowed to somehow slip through the crack, which is so crucial because of how subtle the enemy within works, because of how quiet, because of how much of a sabotage he can cause to us. We are unaware that a lot of the battles that we have been losing is not because we were not able to be praying and we were not doing the things that we were not reading the word and we didn't have the sword in our hands and our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace is not because of any of those things it is because we left ourselves open to the attack of the fifth column and who is that fifth column it is the man on the inside we call him the carnal man and he will wreak havoc, and we are going to see it in a little while. But just before we go there, I want to establish first that anybody that is walking with God, any group, any individual, I want us to know that we are covered, that we have an edge of protection around us. And the Bible warns us to be careful that we don't breach, because if we breach the hedge, we are going to be hurt. And that's Bible. So I want us to turn 
to Job chapter number one, verses six to nine, it kind of establishes a principle, and it is a fact. I, and then afterwards to verses 10 to 12. I want us to understand this is something, it is Bible, and it kind of gives us a way, uh, shows us kind of how God operates, yes, when it comes to people that humble themselves to his leadership when it comes to groups that humble themselves to his leadership he has a hedge of protection around them because he knows what satan will do because he hates us he doesn't want us to advance if it was not for god if it was not for the almighty god i i submit to us that we would have been torn asunder we would have been torn apart we would have been destroyed demolished wiped out that is what would have been our end. I submit that to all of us. But Job chapter 1, <clears throat> verses 6 to 9 tells us, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Brethren, he is like that, and he continues to operate in that way, to, that way today, to the extent that even today, he is called the accuser of the brethren in New Testament times. Though the book of Job is one of the oldest books and was written way back, we see how Satan's mode of operation, his modus operandi is. He presents himself. Why? To accuse. And we'll see it as we go down. And today, in the New Testament scriptures, in the New Testament era, thousands of years later, he is called accuser of the brethren. I say that to say his mode of operation does not change. And if that shield, if that protective hedge was not there, he would have cut us to pieces. Make no mistake about that. So we, we must be very careful how we walk. And I'm coming to that. I just feel impressed to talk to us because sometimes we lose sight of the reality that there is an enemy inside and it is not always Satan and the world and this and that and all. Many times it is, but many times it is not. And I want us to understand some things and we are going through. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? From whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God, and despiseth, eschewest evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Read on. Hast thou not, hast thou made an edge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land before we move i want us before we move from that i want us to see exactly what satan knows and what we should know you have made a hedge about him you have made a hedge about his house and all the things that he's involved in right around every side so his spiritual environment at edges there his material environment his house is a hedge is there. His family, a hedge is there. Simply because what the scripture said before, he is a man that fear God and walk with God and, and, and put aside evil. He knows what the word of God requires and he follows that word. And so he has found favor with God. And as a result of that, a edge, the edge of God is about him and he is blessed. Just as the children of Israel were that we read about in Numbers just a short while ago, God already blessed them, just like he, Job here is blessed. And just like how Job had an edge around him and his surroundings, the children of Israel who were blessed when ba Balaam was trying to curse them, they also had that edge around them. They were, were untouchable. 
Not that things couldn't happen to them, but they would always prevail under God. So we are seeing that same thing happening here now with Job. A hedge was around him and around his domain. And it was the protective hedge of God. And Satan was saying now to God that accuser of the brethren is because you have this around him and you bless him and you increase his substance in the land. That's why he's so faithful to you. That's why he's doing all that he's doing to you. But notice the point. He had an, let's read on, he had a hedge, the hedge of protection around him. But look what Satan said. Put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only you can put forth your hand on him. And Satan went from the presence of the Lord. We won't even have to go any further. The point is, once we are aligned to God and his word, and we take the time out to serve God, and we're coming to Psalm 34, verse 7, and we take the time out to serve God in the way that he wants us to serve him, not in the way that we want to serve him, you know, in the way that he wants us to serve him, it is significant and important to know that we have a hedge of protection around us. Every child of God must understand that. And it therefore behoves us to walk right. We keep that hedge of protection. We become vulnerable and exposed when we start to walk out of alignment with God. Understand that. And the Bible tells us also in Psalm 34 verse 7 that the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him. Yes? The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. That is Bible. So between Job 1 verses 6 to 12 that we just read and again Psalm 34 and verse 7, we are establishing, it is confirming what was said in Job and we, what was said back in Numbers 22 to 24. We see it clearly there was a edge of protection around the people of God. And it is important that we see that. Now, equally important, beloved, we must be very careful that we don't break the edge. We must be careful how we walk. We must be careful of how we allow the enemy inside and all of us have that enemy inside. And I'm coming to that, you know, because I want us to understand that. So that fifth column, that enemy within is latent and is there waiting for the time. He's a fifth column because he knows all that God has for you. He knows where you are heading into the promised land. And although he's with you, he's not there to support you to get there. In other words, and on the other hand, I should say, he is there to try to divert your attention and stop your progress in terms of going into that place that you're striving to go where God wants you to be. That fifth column man, that carnal man inside of you will do everything. He will subvert. He will sabotage. He will do everything to stop you from going over there because he is at enmity with God. This flesh the, 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 the flesh, the carnal man, is always at enmity with God. So what that fifth column is literally doing, actively doing right now, even though you don't know it, he is literally subverting your work. Have you ever wondered that you're going along and everything seems to be going quite fine and coming on so good, and all of a sudden, you just seem to be spiraling out of control? Have you ever looked at your own life? Can you know something that you are doing, but you also, in terms of protecting and defending your walk, but you also know, nobody else knows, you know, but you know that 
there are some things that are happening that you don't somehow you don't have the control over them and some kind of anger just tear up in you and some kind of envy and some kind of strife that cause you to war foment divisions and all kind of things happening and while you're doing that and you're talking and you're doing some things you're still a worshiper you know and you're still reading your bible you know and you're, you're a prayer warrior because you know you can be a prayer warrior and a reading warrior and a worship warrior, but then some things that are happening when you get to brother Paul or sister Sue, or when you get to a group over there, some of the things that aggravate you, you start to pour and then you start to talk and then the talking you now turn into this. And so you start, did you know that those things are being fomented by the fifth column? The enemy inside that wants to see a turning over of the work of God, that wants to see a turning over of your life. And we don't even know it. But listen to what happens. When you look and you see something start to happen in your life now, and things not going as it ought to go, and things are just topsy-turvy every day, and you were expecting this, but that came, you were expecting to overcome, but you fall down. And you say, oh, did I fall? How oh, did this happen? Because I'm praying every day, and I'm a worshiper. And I, but we are, we, do, we are not paying attention to the smaller things that somehow seem smaller, but they are the fifth columns. They are the inside jobs that are being done to pull you down and to turn over the thing. As I said before, when we started, they, they, it is believed by some that there were bombs planted at the, the, the base of the Twin Towers, that when the plane flew into the top, the bombs simultaneously are at, almost at the same time exploded so that the buildings came down, they imploded and came down. It seemed as if it was an inside job, subversive and sabotage and for some other end, some other agenda, they say, well, something similar is happening. So here it is, the big things are happening and you're good on the outside and you're running down the aisles and you're worshiping and you're praying and you're reading, but somehow you still can't seem to have the upper hand. You still can't seem to get to where you want to get to and you're always falling over, falling over. Guess what is happening? You are being subverted. You are being sabotaged. We are being sabotaged by the enemy within the fifth column. And that is happening now. And then you start to see manifesting in your life things going wrong because a hedge, the edge of protection is broken. And all the things that God wouldn't want to come automatically going to come because God has removed the edge because of what we allow the subverter to do. I want us to understand it. So Ecclesiastes, so before we reach Ecclesiastes, so you look and things just not adding up. Everything is being broken. Everything you put your hand to is failing. Everything that you are attempting to achieve in life to build yourself is just not coming together. And you say, oh my God, God has charted this particular path for me? Maybe not. When we are walking with God, and I, I want to distinguish now, and I want to make it clear, because sometimes we are walking in sin to the extent that if anybody knew, we're dropping shame, and we're walking in sin, and we are disobedient to the word of God, and everything that God has said in his word, we are opposed to it. We, 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 are, we don't verbally say it, but our actions live it. Our actions describe it. We, we display it in our actions. And once we are like that and we are opposed to the word of God, we give the word of men more weight and value than the word of God. Can you imagine the word of God say, don't climb up on that hill. And then somebody come from school and say, boy, I am a student at, 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 at UTEC or I am a student at at MIT, and the researchers tell us that we have to research on this particular thing, and so we have to climb the mountain to get the research. And even if the Bible said, no, climb the mountain, it's not good for you. 
You say, well, I know the Bible say it, but I am at university and the researchers say in order to get the answer, we have to do the research this way and the research material, the, 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 the plans that we are going to have to get is only in one location and it is up on the hills of Jaxil. And so we have to climb the, that mountain. And we find an excuse. We find a reason to justify everything, even if the word of God is opposed to it. But the word of man is so weighty and powerful that we find a reason to get around the word so that we can adhere to the word of the people from the university. They say we must go on the hill, even when the word of God said don't go. You know what it is saying? We don't respect the word of God. We don't give value to the word of God. The word of men is more important to us than the word of God. We have allowed the sabotage, the saboteur on the inside to sabotage us. And so we don't even realize that we are giving and placing more weight on the words of men than we are placing on the word of Almighty God. We have breached the edge. And so here, Ecclesiastes chapter number 10 and verse 8. Ecclesiastes chapter number 10 and verse 8 tells us something, um, a simple scripture, but it is, it is, it is profound. He that they get a pit shall fall into it, and not even on that one, but look at the other part. And whoso breaketh an edge, a serpent shall bite him. What is it that is being said here? The hedge of protection, the boundary walls are there. You know, children playing, the boundary walls kind of curve them. They go right across into the road and something hit them off. They, they, they're running after the ball and the ball go out in the road and they just run to catch the ball because they're children. There is a hedge there that they can't just run out. The edge protects them. You see, if you cut out the edge so you can't have space to run out, you're going to be smitten. You're going to be bitten. You're going to be hurt. You cut the edge to make it easy for you. Not knowing that the edge was there to make it hard for you to be hurt. But you have now made a way into the edge because you want an easy way to get to what you want. Not knowing that the edge is there to protect you from being hurt from the thing over there. Even if your ball go over there, the edge is protecting you from death because a car can't hit the child. So, but we cut it out and so when the ball goes, you don't have to run and find a way around to get to the gate. Just run through the hedge. A serpent shall bite you. The hedge, once it is broken, you are exposed. We are exposed. The hand of God that protects and tells Satan, don't touch him, is now drawn back. We are liable to get into things that it was not the working of God because we decide that we are not aligning ourselves with God, but we are doing it or we want it to do. So that when we now create that breach as a result of getting out of alignment with God, a number of things happen. Beloved, we create a point of entry. So not only was the edge to protect us from going out, the edge was also there to protect the enemy from coming in. When we get out of alignment with God and continue in that state of non-alignment, the hedge is broken. And we make room and create space, create a point of entry. We now open a door for Satan to start to inch his way in. A lot of folks don't understand this. A lot of folks don't recognize this. Many folks are under severe demonic oppression because we have opened doors that have allowed Satan into our space and we have allowed demons into our space because we have not aligned ourselves and we have allowed the fifth column, the, 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 the enemy that is within the carnal man to take root in our lives. And he is leading us in a direction opposed to where God wants us to go. Many times when we are into situation 
we did it, it is not Satan and it is not God leading us there. A whole lot of saints right now are in situations that it is not the Lord that led you into that path for his name's sake. You are there as a result of God's judgment. Look at your lives. Let us look at our lives and see how we have been living. See how we have allowed the carnal man, the fifth column, to be working undercover, quietly, secretly, to sabotage your walk with God. What are some of the things that he would have been doing? That fifth column, that enemy inside, that carnal man, that saboteur, what is it that he is doing? Oh, Brother Daly, oh, oh, can I know what is it that he is doing? I want us to understand. I want us to be clear that it is nothing that we don't know. Yes, it is nothing that we don't know. In fact, we know. But we just give little thought and attention to it. So that my assignment in Bible study this evening is to bring it openly before our eyes. So that we can know how the fifth column operates. We can know what we are to do. How to identify, see it glaring at us. And deal with this enemy on the inside. It is important. So we are not demon possessed. And we know that. So many of the times we said Satan do this. Satan is not manipulating our hands and our feet against our will and allow us to just walk over there and to curse and that sister and, or that brother. Satan is not manipulating our hands and feet and just like a puppet carry us to our husbands and our wives and say curse them and done. Satan not doing that. Satan is not holding our hands and manipulating us and pushing us against our will and say, go over there to that brother or to that sister and, and talk, bring up this thing and tear down that one over there. Satan is not doing that. A lot of things that we say, Satan made me do it. Satan did do it. Satan over what? I think I heard somebody say the other day, Satan, them say Satan crying. And them say, Satan, where you ball for? Say, do all of them over there. They may blame me for everything. Uh, you worry for them things they wear themselves do me that even the dead ear I don't even know what them talking about. And Satan was over one kind of ball, you know. The Satan them telling lie on him. Well, unless some folks are possessed and they have no control. And the demons just push them here and push them there as what happened in Bible times and what actually happens today. Unless some folks are demon possessed, which I doubt. So, so he's not manipulating our hands and our feet. And if he even injects things in our minds, we have that ability to push it out. We do have that ability to push it out. But no, we embrace it. We continue to do the things. We support the fifth column. We feed the fifth column. And it is not only the people that work with the fifth column, you know. Not only the fifth column that ultimately will be destroyed, but you see, those that take pleasure in supporting the fifth column, in feeding the fifth column, the saboteur of your soul, all are going to be destroyed. I said it earlier, Balaam knew they couldn't be destroyed from without because they were blessed. He knew that. He, he however knew something that many of us don't know. He however knew something that many of us don't know. Yes? He clearly knew what was in men. He knew that if he could get to the carnal part and have them to start lean to that side, he knew what he could get the children of Israel to do. And he knew that once they get into idolatry, and he knew that once they get into fornication and adultery, and he knew that once they get into murmuring and backbiting and envying, and he knew that once one started just going to roll over into the other, he knew these things. So what did he do? He appealed to their carnal nature 
he appealed within them. And that did them in. That was how Balak was able to see the destruction of the people of Israel. Nothing from outside, but it happened from within. He appealed to their carnal nature. And I want us to understand that. The question is, I, 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 I just want to know, Brother Daly, when you talk about the carnal nature, just, just give it to me. Don't just tell me what you're talking about. What are the things that it is that we are doing that is causing the, the fifth column to tear us to pieces and to bring us down and to cause us to fall on our face? What are you talking about? Talk to me about the carnal man. Now, when we talk about the carnal man, we're talking about things that pertain to satisfying and gratifying the flesh. When we're talking, when we talk about the carnal man, we're talking about the sensual nature of man, the sexual desires that are there. When we talk about the, 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 the carnal man, and when I say sexual desires, you know, I'm, I'm talking about the sexual desires that are uh, manifesting itself and want to gratify itself outside of the, the, the scope of where God allows us to do it. Because this desire and this that is sexual was placed in us by God, but there were certain parameters that were set. And so carnality means going out of that parameter and don't care and it is about me and satisfying me and so once you talk about the flesh it is me and satisfying gratifying this flesh no matter what sexually and otherwise and anything that is opposed to things that are spiritual the carnal man has nothing to do with the spiritual man so anything that wants to walk right and to read the word and to align itself to the word and to to walk circumspectly according to the word Anything that has to do with that, the carnal man is opposed to that. If as a child of God, you are seeking to do right, and as you walk a certain way and deport yourself a certain way, and another child of God says, so what happened to you? Boy, you, you're so holy. You are Mr. Holy, holy. You are more holier than thou. When a child of God starts to call you, you must be Jesus' best friend. I, I submit to you that that person has to be carnal. When another child of God said to somebody who is walking as best as he can and striving for the mastery and striving to align himself with the word, and they can look at you and say, oh, what do you so? You think you're better than anybody else? Any child of God that says that to another child of God that is striving to walk to please God, that person is carnal, yes? And they are supposing, they are supporting, sorry, opposing spiritual growth and development, opposing spiritual things. I submit that to you. The, the, the carnal man is unregenerate, yes? Now, I want us to know something about carnal. Carnal is where we get the word meat. Most folks don't know. Carnal, it, 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 the word meat comes from an old Spanish word, and it, it might even go beyond the Spanish word, but for now, there's an old Spanish word, um, carne, yes? Uh, from that's where we get the word meat from. We see then that to be carnally minded is to live after the things that animals live for. So we get meat from animals. And so carne is a Spanish word for meat, uh, which you get from animals. So there is an association between carne and meat and animals. What do we know about animals? What they basically do? Yes, they eat. They, 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 they shelter and sleep, uh, they breed, right? That, that is when you talk about animals, when you talk about meats, when you talk about carne, you're talking about animals. That pr pretty much they don't have the ability to discern and to be concerned about important things and to be concerned about tomorrow. They just live day to day. Once they get something to eat and once they find a shade later on and once a male and a female animal get together and they just procreate and that's life for the animals. Carnal comes from that word that gives us a hint of how the carnal person is. They don't care. They just want to satisfy the flesh. They just want to 
be involved sexually and once they can satisfy the flesh in that way and they can eat and they can sleep and they can live and there is no care about tomorrow and there is no care about what is important in life uh, what is important for tomorrow what is important for the future St. Matthew 6 33 talks about it you know and just make a note of it you don't even have to turn to it for now uh, but it is just showing how we are different from the animals you know we know that we must serve God we know that what is important now Yes, it's not the things that we have or the things that we don't have. Yes, we must serve God now. We must appreciate God now. We have the ability to think. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's what Matthew 6 is telling us. And then all other things will be added to us. The, but if we are carnal, we are not seeking first the kingdom of God. We are operating in an animalistic mode, the carnal man. And we are just looking for breeding and, and, and getting involved with fleshy things. And we are just looking for eating and sleeping and tomorrow again. And that's all that is on, on our minds. Nothing about the spiritual things. No discerning. No ability to see what is important in life. We are just going through life and living. And that is very significant. That is, that is how the animals operate. And that is how we must strive not to be. And it is important that we understand that as we go further we see where we are to be carnal is to be ruled by one's desires to be ruled by our natural impulse and that is something that we must absolutely get rid of it doesn't matter it absolutely doesn't matter for some what the word of god says and this is where carnal man comes in. The word of God says, don't our desires and natural impulse say, do. And guess what? When we reach the point where we start to do, even when God said, don't, we know that we are carnal. To move and operate in the sinful human state, no matter what. No matter what. The Bible said, don't get drunk. Some people get drunk under the quiet. The Bible said, um, do this or do that or make sure that we're pursuing a certain thing. It don't matter. We don't do it because I guarantee you that as we allow our desires and our natural impulses to rule us, yes, we know. You know, the word of God tells us that we must flee youthful lust, but something deep down tell us no man this guy's handsome this girl is pretty I go, and as far as we're concerned we're just gonna do the thing it don't matter when the word is far from us we just do the things that just naturally comes that our desires just just gravitate to that our impulses dictate to us do this now and when we find that Day after day after day after week after week, we're just, we're, it's almost like we're loose and we have no control. We just keep doing these things. We are then in the flesh. We are then carnal. And I submit to us that that carnal man is the fifth column. It is the things that you are now going to do as a result of that state that you're in that will be your ultimate demise. A lot of people that have backslid and have stepped out of church, it is because they allow the fifth column to take over. So once we are in that carnal state, we don't pray again, we don't read the word of God again, we don't fast again, we don't do anything again. We are in a different state of mind and we ultimately walk out. Nobody get up. No man gets up and walk out overnight on God. It starts at a particular time. It, 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 we decide, it come into our mind and we allow our desire and our natural instincts and impulse to think and to Play up on the thing and it comes to our mind to do this and it was fighting with the word and after a while we just realized that because we allow this carnal man this man on the inside to take charge he now takes charge and everything that god said don't do we do and anything god said we must do we don't we'll find an excuse not to do it and once we are in that state for a period of time any day we can just walk out because we would have drifted long before and i'm telling us 
I'm submitting to us that we must be very careful. We must introspect and see where we are. If we are constantly out of alignment with the word, something is wrong. We have given too much power to the carnal man. We have allowed the carnal man to take over. And that is what comes as a natural consequences, consequence of him being in charge. We don't like the word of God. We don't even like reading the word of God. We don't, and it's, we, there are folks that don't want to listen to Bible study. There are folks that have bet their mind that they're not listening to Bible study because I'm going to hear something that is going to tell me that I must live a certain way and dictating to me how I must live as if anybody can dictate to you outside of the remit of the Bible. I don't want to listen to Bible study because they might tell me what to do and I don't want nobody telling me what to do. As if we are telling you, like our private, personal children, don't do this and do this. No, we are telling you what is contained in the Word. Take it or leave it. And if you're leaving it, know that you're going to walk in carnality and it is just a matter of time. Anybody that don't like the Word, don't like Bible study, for, and call it anything that you want to call it because there is a tendency that the carnal man has where he, a man that backslide the carnal man allows that to happen because that is his ultimate goal the fifth column want to see you fall so after a while he pushes at you don't read the word he pushes at you because carnality and spirituality are opposed and you rise, allow that carnal man to rise. You don't read the word, you don't pray, you don't do anything. You're going to backslide. So one day somebody talk to, to you from the Bible and say, hey, shape up. Guess what? The man who backslides now turns out. The woman who backslides turns out. You ever listen to a backslider when, when they're talking to you? Oh, are them people that say something, man, thing, I'm going to walk. No backslider has ever said they turn their back on God. Is always somebody say this, somebody do that, a preacher preach on me, a teacher teach on me, a sister said that about me, I me here. You listen to any backslider in the carnal state, you don't even take responsibility for your errors. Because the carnal man is in charge. It is a sign of the carnal man. You never hear a backslider say, boy. Jesus, we couldn't bother with the Jesus thing anymore. And boy, so a struggle. No, they're not going to say it. They're going to tell you about somebody who made them backslide. That's the carnal man at work. And we ought to be very careful. And anybody, any saint, anywhere. So, you know, so some pastors don't like to talk like this because they say it is offensive to the saints and the saint may not come back. So what? The saint will find someone where they talk softer than that. We don't talk hard. We preach and teach the unadulterated truth. What might be hard is how the word hits, but if it's the word, it's the word. But we're not troubling anybody, and we're not, no, you know, so we take with time. But the word is the word. Notice, the Bible talks about walking after the flesh. It talks about minding the things after the flesh, as opposed to walking after the spirit and minding the things of the spirit. What are some of the things of the flesh that we must mind so that we don't get involved? What are some of the things of the spirit that we must mind so we embrace? Galatians 5, 19 to 21 talks about them. We're not even going to get to go into them. But they're all there. Read it. I want to be clear to you now. These are the things that make up the fifth column. The carnal man is a set of things that when combined together create almost a personality that is diametrically opposed to the things of God. I want us to understand that. Galatians 5, 19 to 21. Look here, beloved. Read it. Let us read it so we can see the things. And it talks about fornication and adultery and envy and lasciviousness and, and, and divisions and strife. Look at them. It gives a picture of the things that make up the carnal man. And don't be fooled. The Bible towards the end in verse 20 says, anybody that engage in these things, in other words, entertain and keep and embrace the carnal man. He has no place in the kingdom of God. 
The other folks going to tell you, look here, man. God knows say you're a sinner. God knows say you're going to do these things. And God still save you. Then if him can save you in that, him can keep you in that. And try your best, don't do it. But if you don't do it, and because God knows you're frail and you're weak, don't worry yourself. Him did know say you're free a long time and him still save you. So once you save, you're saved. Don't worry. Lie. Lie. And I submit to us tonight. We're telling you straight as it is. They that do these things don't have any part in the kingdom of God. According to Galatians 5, I think it's up about verse 20 there. And I'm telling it to you. No other way. You don't have any part in the kingdom of God. You're not going to make it into the kingdom of God. We have to move to get out and kill the carnal man, the fifth column. The one that is subverting your walk with God. And you don't even know it. Introspect, beloved. Now, Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 to 23. On the other hand, it talks about the thing that we must be mindful of, which are the spiritual things. And if we take our time and read through, we will see those things. Galatians 5, 22 to 23. So we're not even going to get to go through them just now, but it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. And you take your time and go through. 1 Corinthians 13 speaks about love. And that is a chief trait of the spirit any child of God that don't love them brother and love them sister you have allowed the fifth column the, the, to take a hold of your life you're not gonna make it you're not gonna make it anybody that don't love their fellow men your brothers and your sisters and you're in art and you're constantly fighting and you constantly have them you have a problem so again, the preachers and teachers don't want to say these things to their congregants because they're afraid that people are going to leave because you tell them, say, they're not going to heaven. No, you're not going anywhere. None of us. And if I do these things and continue in these things, I'm not going anywhere either. None of us going anywhere. If it's God heaven you're talking about, forget it. So it is important. First Corinthians 13 talks about love. And as I said, it's a chief trait. Chief trait. And it is important that we understand that. No love, no heaven. No love, you can't work with your brother and your sister. You are carnal. We are carnal if there is no love. Read the scriptures as we go through. Now I'm getting ready to close because now the time is going and I'm trying to you know, push it a little faster. First Corinthians chapter 3, Paul was talking to the Corinthians and he asked a very pertinent question. And I have it here on the same slide, but on the bottom. He asked a very pertinent question. And that question is this. Why are ye yet carnal? 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Take your time and read through that chapter. But you see, Paul literally asked this question to the, the believers that were there. Why did he ask it? It came out of the fact that some things were happening within that church. And folks had kind of caused a, 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 a factions to be there. And they had taken sides and it had caused some kind of division. And folks had taken sides. So some said that I am of Paul, you know, I came from Paul ministry or whatever. And another said, I am of Apollos, you know. Apollos was the one that preached when I got saved. And so there was some faction there. There was some, you know, they were pledging their support one for either Paul or Apollos. And saying, look here. Paul called it out. The apostle called it out. And he said to them, you know what is at the root of this? You are yet carnal. The carnal man is at play. This is what he's doing. And by having those factions, you know, and causing those strife and division, it, is, it, it would seem to shake the church. But what the folks don't even know, it is actually hurting them. It is actually hurting them even more than it will hurt the church because whereas the church will have its battering, the church will always stand. I said that at the start, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So the church is going to stand no matter what. But you see, the folks who purvey these things and allow the carnal man to take control of them and cause these things to happen, watch out. Your day is coming if you don't deal with that carnal man, if you don't take care of that enemy within that fifth column. You're going to be out and wonder, when did I reach here? How is the mighty fallen? 
It's going to wonder. So Paul called it out and said carnality was at the root. And he picked out three main things that was at the center of the strife and the division that was happening in there that he called out and called carnality. Three main things. He said, look here. Why are there envying and strife and division among you? So he saw that these, and incidentally, these are some of the very things that were in Galatians that we read earlier on, in Galatians um, chapter 6 that we read earlier on. These are some of the, very, sorry, Galatians chapter 5. These are some of the very same things that Paul identified in Galatians 5 as he spoke to the church in Galatia. So you see that wherever you are, it don't matter if it's Corinth, the Corinthian church or the Galatian church, it's the same principle. You allow the carnal man, He's going to subvert your walk with God. He's going to fight against your striving for the Lord. And if you allow him to take control, you are going to fall. How does he operate? He operates through things like envying and strife and division. And these are three things that Paul picked out in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And I, since he picked out these three things, I wanted us to just quickly understand what these three things represent. I want us to understand what these things are and so that we can see easily how three simple things can mess up a life, right? We have to understand. Paul picked them out, envying, strife, division. The question is, when we talk about envy, what is it? You say to feel resentful and unhappy because someone else possess or have achieved what you wanted for yourself to possess and achieve. You're vexed, you're resentful, you're unhappy. These are traits of envying. If you find that you want to have what somebody else have to the point where you become bitter and resentful of the person that is envy. And Paul said, look here, get rid of it. It was at the heart of the contention of the church at Corinth, what the issue that Paul was de dealing with in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. It was at the heart. And we have a final, when you're frequently comparing yourself to others to see if you are there and you're equal to the task and all of those things, be very careful. When you exhibit passive aggressive behavior so you feel bitter in it but you see the person but you're smiling with them and while you're talking bitterness boiling up inside of you you are envious and it is important to understand that expose that carnal man that's what we're doing so that we can know says go to god and say god help me it's time to fast and pray and get rid of this fifth column which is causing mayhem in many lives hmm? Where we, you know, other people achieve things and you're, you're talking about it, you're downplaying it. When you find that you're downplaying other people's achievements, you just don't, you can't be happy with them and you can't rejoice with them and you don't play there. Oh, that's nothing. Your man I hear say, him get the, the PhD or the master's or him get a promotion in him job, but I mean, that is nothing with him. And you really need them would have wanted to have something like you are envious and you're allowing the carnal man to have you and you're you're talking soft and nice but deep down that bitterness we call it passive aggressive behavior be very very careful you struggle to genuinely celebrate when others experience success that's an envious spirit beloved if you find that these things are there i am exposing it for you introspect and look and if you see it you are being subverted. It is just a matter of time. Like what happened to the children of Israel over there by Moab. It is just a matter of time. Sometimes it's not the things outside what you protect yourself against, but what you allow to and, and foster on the inside. That will be the downfall of many. That is how Israel fell and received the judgment of God. But there in numbers and the hedge of God was removed from around them. I want you to understand that you cannot have envying as a part of your walk with God. It is a fifth column. It is a part of the carnal man. It will bring you down. Strife. Yes? 
vigorous and bitter conflict. Constant quarreling and struggling and clashing. You and your bridge. And it can be you, you're talking about this and that, and you're just constantly struggling and you have difference and you can't reconcile and you're quarreling and you're struggling and and sometimes these things happen covertly. In the quiet, nobody even know. You're gonna get a few friends, and you're tearing this, and you're tearing that, and there's seemingly be this on one side and this on the other side, and you in the middle, fasting and fomenting it. Strife, Paul said to the Corinthian church, it is at the heart of your carnality. If you find that you are in such a situation where you have to find a little corner with this one to quarrel over this and tear down that one and who support this one and who support that one or who support this ministry or who support that ministry. Uh, look here at the heart of it is the carnal man pushing himself in and seeking to destroy you, not the church, because none of us powerful enough to destroy the church of God. But we are being hindered, we are being affected. And the third one was divisions. We have to understand these things. And sorry, before we reach the third one, the, the, the wise man wrote in Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 3, and this is, a, this is a very significant one, Proverbs 20. It might be good that we just quickly look at this one. And it has to do with, you know, this constant strife and, 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 and quarrel and all those kind of things. Very important. Proverbs 20 verse 3, it simply says this. Um, it is an honor. For a man to cease from strife. But every fool will be quick to quarrel. Or every fool will be meddling. In other words, every fool will be quarreling. Same word means meddle there is a word that means quarrel or struggle or clash. So it is fools that constantly meeting into places to struggle and to quarrel and to clash and to, no, 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 don't do it. Don't do it. It is fools that do that. The, it is an honor of one to avoid strife. So when you see strife, when you see these things, when you see the carnal disposition that seeks to get folks to one here, one there, and talk about this, and who this, and who that, and cause strife. The honorable man take away himself. The honorable woman take away herself. But the fools run into it and keep the quarrel going. And it is a part of what make up the carnal man, which is subverting you which is subverting your progress in God, which is subverting your non-spiritual activities, the thing that you're hoping to achieve, even at work or in your business, it is being torn down and subverted by the carnal man. Because God is not going to be with you in the way that you are expecting. And finally, Paul talks about divisions. Yes? He talks about divisions. Um... And when we talk about division, we're talking about differences or disagreements between two or more groups, you know, and it typically produces tension. We want to avoid that. We want to get out of that. We want to make sure that that is not a part of our modus operandi. So, so envying, strife, and division, the three things that Paul identified as at the root of the carnality problem in the church at Corinth that caused them to separate themselves on divisions and who is from Paul and who is from Apollos. Get rid of it. It will mash you up. It will mess you up. The carnal man is fighting against you. You is one of your own worst enemies. And I have to say that you, nobody else, we have to see and understand and be very clear of the role that you play, that I play in messing up myself. And that is very, very, very significant. It is the enemy within that is at the heart of a lot of the things that are happening to us. So let us jump and let us jump to the next slide again after this one, because we're going to try to wrap up now, because I, I, I know that the we should be wrapping up now, so I'm just jumping ahead. So I said what I just said, 
and I'm very passionate about it. It's very important that we understand that we understand that when we talk about a spiritual, that a carnal man, it is it is a real force at work. It is a real force at play, and the intent and the intention is to triple the child of God to triple the sin that is trying to do their best to walk with God. And we see it manifesting itself. We see that carnal man manifesting itself in all the things that we read about in Galatians chapter 5. We see it manifesting itself whenever we look around and we see uh, as if there is a push for envying and for strife and for the vision. Whenever we look and we see folks pushing and we see and we hear of things about fornication and adultery and, and homosexuality and all of those things, I submit to us, I put it to us, we are some of our worst enemies. When, when, when we allow the carnal man to take charge, we are going to regret it and we are going to be out of this thing, we are going to be out of the running and we are going to say, how did it happen? We did not constrain, we did not rein in the carnal man. And as I said, for, for just reinforcing it, yes, the carnal man is composed, is made up of the, these things and the wickedness and the lying and the envying and the backbiting and the strifes and the seditions and the, 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 the divisions and all of these the, the lasciviousness and the, 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 the sensual thinking and the reveling and all of these things together make up the carnal man and as I said it manifests itself in how we act and how we talk to each other and how we lie on each other and how we set up each other. It, it, Anybody that finds themselves doing these things and want to tear down this one and to see that one fall, a wicked and carnal man is a man that wants to see his brother fall and do things with the view to see him fall. That's a spirit of Balaam. And let me tell you now, the spirit of Balaam has come, is lurking, because what the spirit of Balaam is all about, in addition to other things, but within the context of what we are presenting, is to find a way to get you, not from outside, but from inside, to trip up. That spirit knows how base the carnal man is. And he's going to work on your flesh. It's going to work on your flesh to cause you now to fall into one of the things that we have been reading about in Galatians chapter 5. You know, and coming down. He's doing everything. That spirit can be rampant because we would have allowed the hedge to be broken, cause a door to be open, entryway to be open for the spirit to come in and cause havoc in our lives. Be very, very careful. Earlier on, we talked about, we saw being minded, you know, uh, if I can just um, get back to it, we at one point talk about walking after the flesh and minding the things of the flesh. Then we, as opposed to walking in the spirit and minding the things of the spirit, those are significant terms. That term minded is a very crucial term in scripture. I'm closing now. It's a very crucial term, right? It means how we are inclined to think in a particular way. So we have to be careful how we are minded, you know. You know, we can be carnally minded um, and we can be spiritually minded. And we have to be careful. So understand when we talk about how we are minded, how we are inclined to think, the way that we, 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 we fashion and push our mind, or we, the kind of mindset that we establish, the things that catches our affection and our attention. It is very important that we understand that, yes, very important that we understand these things because how we are minded in terms of how we are inclined to think will determine where our heart and our focus is. Many of us are focused on things that are not spiritual. And I just want to be honest and still that as a fact, you can see it. 
you can discern it. Whether we are old or we are young, many saints today, their focus is not on the things of God. Their focus is not on things that are spiritual. Their focus is not on things that are building the kingdom of God. A totally, totally different focus. And this is very important that we recognize that as we call it out, just introspect. Don't point a finger and say, boy, Pastor Daly judging me. Brother Daly loves to judge people. I'm not judging anybody. But it is easy to see. It is easy to discern across with some folks. It is not difficult. And our focus is everywhere else than on what matters most, the things of God, God himself. We have opened ourselves and give free reign to the carnal man, and it manifests itself in how we deal with our brothers and our sisters, how we hate our brothers and our sisters, how we don't like that set over there, so, or how we don't like that one over there, so, or we can't take Pastor Daly or Bishop Daly, and I can't take Sister T, T or, or Sister M, and we can't take that one, and we can't take that one, that, that, that is wrong. We have given the carnal man, and we do that often enough, I submit to you today that you have broken the, the breach. The hedge around you is removed. And Balaam's spirit, that spirit of Balaam that is going to be set loose in the camp, it is going to affect you. And it is going to prey upon the carnal man. And you are going to do the things that the carnal man pushes you to do. And we do those things over and over long enough. And we are going to find that, like Israel, the judgment of God is going to fall. Like Israel, after a while it reached the point that when they reached Canaan, God caused a whole set of them to wander till they die out. He swore that they were not going to head over into the promised land. I don't want that to happen. I want us to introspect, understand that there is a fifth column that the enemy is not only Satan and the world and the things of the world and all that kind of stuff, which is important that we understand that. But I want us to see through a similar lens the size of the carnal man and what he is doing to subvert your walk. It's going to end up for many being an inside job that sees us tumble like the Twin Towers in New York inside job fifth column was there and i've exposed the fifth column to you that carnal man it behoves all of us then to look again see how we are living how we are operating if we have given too much space and time and energy to the carnal man which is ultimately going to lead to our demise and if we have tonight is the night to take the step to re organize to realign and to set the course right so that the spirit man have the preeminence so that we are minded to walk in the spirit and to give to this experience what it requires 100 percent with all your might with all your strength with all that you have give it to serving the living God and give no space to the carnal man who is your enemy, who is subverting your walk, who is the fifth column and want to see you implode. God bless you tonight. I'm going to close in prayer, but just before I pray, I think there is something and I don't want to take away from the spirit of the lesson, but it is still ministry. I'm going to put something across the screen. It has to do with the faith majestic temple. Um, they have on Friday, and I believe it is this coming Friday, their one day women's conference. I am really, really imploring, and I'm going to ask our brethren to, just to make some time to be with them. They definitely require and request our support. I know it is going to be a challenge, and at the same time, it is going to be a sacrifice. I really want us to make the sacrifice. And so, we will again send something in the group, in the, on the platform, but I'm really, really asking and encouraging. I, since it's a women's conference, 
I suspect, I'm not sure, but I believe it is something, is, is it a women's only event? I, I am uncertain. Uh, so, but I see where Evangelist Solomon is going to be talking, and I know when she was here reaching out to the ladies, it was a ladies only thing. So I'm going to ask all our ladies, 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 I call upon you. We want to hear Evangelist Solomon. She's from the Linstead Pentecostal Church, and she did um, give us food for thought when she was here with our ladies the other uh, sometime last year, it was a powerful presentation, and so we want to be there. We want our ladies to be there, amen, so that you too, like the saints at Faith Majestic, can unfold, yes, the beauty within. So I encourage us and, 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 and really ask us to go down in our numbers and give them our full support, maximum support, be a part of this great one-day um, women's conference over there. God richly, richly bless you. So we're going to be praying at this time. Can we just bow our heads? Father, we bless your great and wonderful name. We bless you, mighty God, the great God and eternal life. Thank you for allowing us another time to sit in the presence of God. We are in different places, but we are in the presence of God, taking in, tuning in to Bible study. Father, I pray that you will help us to kill the carnal man, to kill the carnal nature. Help us to understand how he manifests the strife and envying and divisions and seditions and all the different things that the scripture points that is a reflection of the work of the carnal man. Help us to see it and to move away from the things and to kill the carnal man so that we can then move to build the spiritual man and we can be strong men and women of God walking in the presence of God, lifting the bloodstained banner, moving ahead with the kingdom business. Have your own way in our lives, mighty God, and let your will perfect will be accomplished in our lives. We give you thanks. Bless us tremendously. And as we depart, depart with us, mighty God. We thank you for what you have done, what you're doing, and what you will continue to do. And we place the saints, all of us, into your capable hands. Keep, I pray. We give you thanks. We give you praise in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise God. Praise God. you to being with you god's willing next week same time same place in the name of the lord jesus god bless you in jesus name praise god praise god